you write about how white feminism works alongside or works with racism, capitalism, and empire. And the empire thing struck me because another contemporary example, George W. Bush came out after Biden withdrew from Afghanistan and was saying, well, what about the women? What about the women in Afghanistan? And that is another, I think, great manifestation of this dynamic, or not great, but a uh, great example of the, the, this dynamic that you're describing. Absolutely. And especially when it comes to women in the Middle East, that has been a major thread actually for 130, 40 years, that it is the goal of white women uh, to help save women from s- supposedly less civilized societies. Uh, the, the theorist uh, Gayatri Spivak put it really well um, in the 1980s. She said it's the rhetoric of um, white women trying to save brown women from brown men. And it ends up actually just reinforcing the idea that the U.S. is a beacon of progress and, and white civilization and that you can use uh, feminism as a not just a cover for imperialism, but an explicit rationale for imperialism. Yes, it's it's totally twisted, but I mean it, that 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 is a view that a lot of people hold. Like that, during uh, during the Afghanistan war, I believe there were protests about save women from the Taliban by uh, women in this country, and it's um it, it is very very narrow. And I I guess I do want to now dive into the chapters of your book um, where you you do this this great thing where you pair a white feminist from a time and or or a topic with a black or indigenous or trans uh, feminist in, of a similar period and you highlight these contrasts. So I guess we can start with with this first example, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Francis E.W. Harper. Um, can you talk about their stories and, and how they contrast and uh, converge? Yeah, I was really interested in this book and not just telling a critique of white feminism, but showing that white feminism has actually been sidestepping a vibrant form of feminism for true equality all along. And so the first chapter contrasting Stanton is particularly dramatic, I think, because you know Stanton is often considered with her and Susan B. Anthony, her, her compatriot in the movement, as the founders of feminism. Um, and as the, you know, the, the most primary significant feminist actress of their time. Uh, but Stanton and Anthony both, in the wake of Reconstruction, actually reinforced racism as a way to further their own, their own aims. And that's because after Reconstruction, Black men were awarded the right to vote, but not white women. And Stanton in particular gave many, many racist stump speeches where she used all kinds of derogatory language and saying and said things like, you are letting the most ignorant, debased, degraded elements of society vote, but you are not letting your pure, white, potentially Mayflower descendant wives who are a vote, and therefore you're denying a moral force in society. She's the name we have. She's the, the, the statue we have in Central Park. <laughs> Um, And yet there was always another kind of feminism that I think is especially exemplified by the poet Frances E.W. Harper, who was a person many people probably haven't heard of, Um, even though she was a writer who sold 50,000 books in the 1860s, which is an astonishing number for that era. Um, And she was a, a raised so much money from her books and her lecture tours that she actually was a major funding source for the Underground Railroad. She gave hundreds and hundreds of lectures a year on women's rights and women's rights as a partner of a post-reconstruction movement for for, for Blacks to gain uh, land, literacy, and liberation was her framework. Hers was a framework for Black self-sufficiency and resilience and sustainability um, that meant actually getting control of some of the means of production. It was quite different from a a message of the purity and morality of white women that Stanton offered. And yet Harper has been largely erased from feminist history outside of some academic circles. And, and is that because of the intersectional feminist 
I mean, I guess I'm asking you to editorialize a bit, but how would yeah. you, you know, one, we just, we herald uh, our white uh, members of history to a degree that's very odd and also racist. Um, but also, would you say that that's a largely deliberate suppression of that kind of feminism because of the the multi-pronged nature of of that feminism and how many things it challenges, including capitalism? I think so, right? We're, we're so accustomed to the idea that feminism means the belief in gender equality. That when feminism comes along with all these other campaigns also, it looks like, well, that's a Black women's issue. Instead of, oh, no, this is a feminism that's actually recognizing if we are going to redress the effects of slavery in the U.S., that means actually changing our structure of social relations, of our economy, of the idea that you can sacrifice entire populations for the bottom line. It looks a lot more complicated than feminism. And what's fascinating and, um, is that that suppression, as when you look at the historical record, you can actually look exactly when and where it happened. We don't have to make conjectures about, yeah, that's it probably got sidestepped. We can actually see, yes, it got excluded. And that's because the first time that anyone thought there could be such a thing as a history of feminism or the women's movement was when none other than Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony themselves sat down in the 1880s to write the history of the women's movement. And they produced a four volume work that has become the set of records for historians up till now about what feminism looked like. And they deliberately left Harper out of the volume. They had had so many battles with her on platform stages of conventions around the country that they left her out and instead they really elevated Sojourner Truth and they turned Sojourner Truth into a figure who only supported women and left out her critiques of racism. And actually to be um, even used versions of Sojourner Truth speeches that were written by white women and made her sound like a plantation mammy when in fact she was a speaker of, of standard English and was not from the South. Um, and the original transcriptions of her speeches look nothing like the anti-woman version of Sojourner Truth we've inherited today from Stanton and Anthony. That is, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, it is believable, but it, it it's just unreal. Like, and, and two, how deliberate you, you wrote about how deliberate Stanton's pivot really was to racism was there, is interesting as well. Can you flesh that out? Yeah, um, she well, what's interesting about her pivot is that there were there were preludes there all along. She had long supported the idea that women needed the vote because they were the most moral, upright figures of society. And when they fully joined the democratic process, the idea was that they would help redeem the nation as a whole. Um, from her very first speech to the New York State Legislature, she established her own authority as a Mayflower descendant and a descendant of a Revolutionary War hero. So she really leaned into the fact that she was uh, what she called, you know, blue-blooded and was um, belonged to the richest family in town. In and that's, town. that sounds a little white supremacy e in and of itself. <laughs> exactly. I mean, she was also an abolitionist, right? But if this is a kind of abolition that supports the end of slavery, but isn't willing to go all the way to eradicating racism as a structure. Um, and um, then... But, but after 1865, then it became much more a battle. You know, Susan B. Anthony said things like, I will cut off my right hand before I give the vote to black men before women. Um, and she had long been a, a partner and collaborator with Frederick Douglass. But when she started giving speeches, you know, major convention speeches, railing against immigrants from China, immigrants from Ireland, uh, against Sambo was a, a term she used regularly, um, and actually joined partnership with a very notorious white supremacist uh, newspaper um, uh, magnet. Um, then um, she lost many of her allies and people like Frederick Douglass and Frances Harper actually broke away from Stanton's Anthony and formed a whole new organization 
that fought for women's rights alongside black rights, because Stanton and Anthony's organization really became about white rights above all. One of her, one of Anthony's, or um, one of their protégés actually would even say in her stump speeches, white supremacy will be strengthened by women's suffrage. And so it's a, it's a deliberate political pivot and it, and the sadness of it is that did lead to some success. And like that, that's, I would, could you, would it be fair to say that that is the birth of white feminism today? (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Um, And what's, what's so harmful about it is that so often it's deemed the birth of feminism, right? Instead of the birth of white feminism alongside this other feminism led by people like, Harper and to some degree Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass and others, which we could now call the birth of intersectional feminism. Even though that term intersectional feminism wasn't actually coined until the 1980s by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw. 